Hey everyone, so this video is about uh, thresholds, and in this particular case what we mean by thresholds is the difference between when your brain would or would not be able to detect um, things at a certain level. So for example, obviously there are lights that eventually will become so dim, or a frequency of sound waves or of light waves that are too high or too low, uh, eventually you know, taste uh, or smell, the number of particles will become too um, um, weak, and, and eventually your brain won't be able to tell that they're there anymore. And so that's what I mean when I say thresholds. Now, one thing you're going to see multiple times in this video, and I will refer to multiple times in this video, is um, 50%. Now, the 50% is basically just a hit-miss rate that they consider to be the minimum value of what they would consider to be successful. So, for example, if they had you listening to frequencies of a beep and you had to, you know, indicate, yes, I did detect it or no, I did not detect it, um, or they, you know, they flashed a light um, um, at a certain speed and you had to tell, tell them whether or not you did or did not detect it. Um, if, for example, you, you know, in 25 trials, you detected it 18 times at a certain level, then that would be considered above threshold because they basically said that the ratio has to be 50-50 at a minimum. So at any threshold, if you are able to see it, smell it, hear it, feel it, whatever, and through multiple, um, multiple tests at that same value or that same level, if you're able to feel it or smell it or taste it, etc., then that would be considered above the 50-50 mark, then that would be considered a successful ratio of detection. If it's at 50-50, that's the minimum, and then anything below 50-50 uh, that would be what we're going to call subliminal. Now, a lot of times when you hear the word subliminal, a lot of people immediately go to subliminal messaging, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, however, the term itself, subliminal, is not nearly as mysterious, not nearly as um, um, interesting as what I think people often make subliminal messaging to be. Uh, so I apologize. I might uh, kind of ruin that one for you. So um, let's talk about three thresholds here right off the bat. So um, the first one is what is called absolute threshold. Uh, his name was Gustav Fechner. And essentially what uh, absolute threshold means is what is the barest bare minimum of a sense um, that a brain, that the human brain could detect. Like, when would your eyes react to this? When would your ears react to this and your brain be able to register it? Uh, as I've talked about in other videos, you know, the human brain, there's the visual light spectrum, but there's also light waves like infrared or ultraviolet light that are outside of our visual spectrum. Those are frequencies we can't pick up. So those would be described as being beyond the absolute threshold. There are, uh, uh, there is certainly a decibel level that eventually you will hit that is beyond, um, the absolute threshold. And so according to Fetchner, he basically says that every one of your sense organs, there should be a minimum, bare minimum, like how low can you go, or in some cases, how high can you go and still detect it, and still be able to be able to be detected 50% of the time or more. So when you reach the barest, barest minimum that you can detect, he describes that as the absolute threshold. Now, the problem with absolute threshold is it's more hypothetical than it is realistic because you will never be in environments where the barest absolute threshold minimum will really come into play. You know, there's always going to be background noises, uh, even your own breathing. Uh, there will usually be some interference of light, uh, some interference of other smells, um, um, another reason why Fechner's theory is more hypothetical than it is realistic is simply because when, you know, as you grow older, your eyes become weaker, your ears become weaker, and therefore 
they would not be able to detect things that they could have necessarily done when you were younger. Therefore, absolute threshold essentially goes out of the window. It's just not possible. Now, he did give some examples. Uh, for example, he did believe you could hear a watch ticking. Now, back in his day, it would have been like a pocket watch. Uh, but he believed you could hear a watch ticking from 20 feet away. Uh, most of the time, I wouldn't be able to hear my watch ticking, my wristwatch ticking from, from a foot away. Um, because of so many other variables. Uh, he believed you could see a candle flame flickering from 30 miles away. Uh, the horizon doesn't even go 30 miles. Uh, this would not be applicable to stars, because there's other stars out there. Um, the uh, This would also assume that there's no such thing as fo or fog or or, or smog or pollution or haze. And so while these might be possible, they're not realistic. So he's really just offering up what does he think the perfect specimen of an eye, the perfect specimen of a human ear, the perfect specimen of a human nose, what could it really do at the barest minimum half the time? So that's what he means by absolute. Now let's talk about two thresholds that really are relevant to your daily life. So these are two different ones. Please don't get them confused with each other. It's definitely easy to do. One is called signal detection theory, and one is called response criteria. So signal detection theory says the minimum stimulus will be dependent on the environment you are in. So compare something such as being in the library versus being at a party. If you are in the library, your friend, who is trying to get your attention from outside your point of view, how low could they whisper and get your attention? It might be pretty low. However, if you are at a loud party, your friend, to get your attention from outside your point of view, they might have to talk loud or possibly yell at you as the minimum, as just as the minimum to be able to get your attention. So signal detection theory says the environment you are in will radically change the bare minimum. So if you are in, again, let's say you're in the library, the minimum amount of smell somebody's food or coffee or whatever might have to produce for you to pick it up might be pretty low because there isn't necessarily that much competition. But if you were, for example, in foods class or at a restaurant, the ability for one smell to be detectable compared to the rest of them, that thing might have to be pretty pungent for you to pick it up. So, you know, if you're in a pretty dark space, you know, if somebody, you know, if, if there was a particular light that you were trying to find, that might be a lot easier than if there was lots and lots of lights and it's a very distracting environment. Same thing if there's lots of words on a page versus very few words on a page. The minimum amount of stimulus will change depending on the environment. Again. And remember, we're always talking about the minimum. What's the minimum it would take? Well, the minimum in the library might be a low decibel level. The minimum at a party or at a concert might be them screaming at you. So it's always about the minimum half the time, but the minimum will drastically change dependent on the situation you are in. Now, response criteria is also about the minimum changing, but in this case, the minimum changing is about the minimum changing based on how you are feeling. So this is about like, you know, when you are awake versus when you're tired, when you're paying attention versus when you're distracted, when you're sick versus when you're well, when you're expecting something versus when you're not expecting something, uh, when you're stressed versus when you're calm, uh, you know, when you're wide awake versus when you're sleepy, um, you know, you know, when you're emotional versus homeostatic. The response criteria says that as you change, the minimum amount might also have to change. So when you are walking down the hallway and you're calm and you're paying attention and you're feeling good, your friend might be able to get your attention with little to no effort at all. However, if we put you in that hallway again, same amount of you know environmental stuff, so this isn't about the environment, it's about you, but you're really stressed and you're really upset and you're really tired and now your friend tries to get your attention, it could take a lot more. So, you know, if one person, for example, is hungry and one person is full, 
the person who's hungry will likely hear the microwave go off before the person who's full. Um, you know, so if you are really stressed, uh, sorry, if you're really distracted, let's say you're really distracted and somebody else is paying a lot of attention and, you know, a car pulls out in front of you, um, they will likely react to the car faster than you because of their attention versus your distraction, even if you saw them both at the same exact time. Even if, you know, you heard something or saw something or smelled something at the exact same time as someone else and your organs, your sense organs work the same, their state of mind versus your state of mind might determine who is likely to hear something first or who is likely to see something first. So that is called response criteria. So both of these work at the same time. You know, if you're in a library versus a concert, it's going to take less to get your attention. But if you're in the library and you're calm versus you're in the library and you're stressed or you're in the library and you're well versus sick or stressed versus homeostatic or whatever, they might have to talk louder to get your attention than they would have if you had been paying attention or were not stressed out. So it cha both of these are basically moving targets that change based on both your situation and the environment for which you are in. So hopefully those make sense to you. Again, these are always assuming a 50-50 ratio hit and miss. Uh, obviously, they test these sometimes in a controlled environment for the rest of the time. You certainly can see why, you know, where you are at and how are you doing has a lot to do with whether or not you pick stuff up or don't pick stuff up. You know, your parents could be asking, you know, from downstairs, they could be asking for you, and you might not be purposely uh, uh, ignoring them at all. But, you know, obviously, if you have music on, that will make it harder for them for you to detect them than if the music wasn't on. At the same time, again, we're not assuming you're actually purposely ignoring them, but if you're busy doing, you know, work on your computer, it might take longer for you to hear them than it would be if you were maybe reading a book or something. So the response criteria and the signal detection theory both change. Now, these two right here, definitely a lot easier to understand, I think, and uh, just don't get them mixed up with each other. Uh, so the definition of a false positive is when you think you detected something and it turns out it either wasn't there or it wasn't what you thought it was. That's called a false positive. False positive, you thought you heard it, you thought you saw it, you thought you smelled it, etc. But it turns out it wasn't either what you thought it was or maybe it wasn't something at all. So, for example, you're driving in the dark and all of a sudden on the side of the road, you're like, oh my god, that's a deer, please don't come out in front of me. And then it turns out it was a bush or it turns out it was a mailbox or, oh my god, that, you know, that, that, that turtles in the road, and then as you get closer, it turns out, nope, it was actually just a cardboard box or something. Well, you just committed a false positive, because you reacted under the assumption it was one thing, and it turns out it was something else. Uh, a false positive, another good example of false positives is, you know, you know, you're doing something, and all of a sudden you look up, and you're like, what, what? And people are like, well, what? And you're like, oh, I thought I heard somebody say my name, or I thought somebody said my name, and nobody said your name. Well, that's a false positive. You thought you heard your name. It didn't happen. I'm sure you've been embarrassed before by a false positive. Maybe you saw somebody, um, you know, far away from you and you're like, hey, I know them. That's my friend. But they had their back turned to you. So you go up to them and then you get their attention. They turn around and they are not your friend. And you're like, oh, my goodness, I'm so, so sorry and embarrassed because I thought you were somebody else. Another really good example of a false positive and um, it occurs so much now uh, that it actually has its own name. It's called Phantom Vibration Syndrome. So Phantom Vibration Syndrome, as you can imagine, is about cell phones. So Phantom Vibration Syndrome is when you check your phone solely because you either thought you heard it go off or you thought you felt it vibrate. Um, that is a false positive. And like all of you, I certainly have those. Occasionally, I have um, reached into my pocket to check my phone that I definitely heard go off or definitely thought I felt it vibrate, and my phone wasn't even in my pocket. And there was no way I could have possibly felt it or heard it because it wasn't even in the room at the time. Uh, that is called a false positive, and they are quite common. So you're like, oh man, I thought I smelled cookies, but nope, sorry, that was just wishful thinking. Congratulations, you committed a false positive. 
Now, the exact opposite of this is a false negative, and a false negative is when you miss something, even though it was plenty loud enough, plenty bright enough, plenty smelly enough, but you missed it. And you probably missed it because you were either not paying much attention or because you were not looking that way, even though you technically were looking that way, but your mind wasn't looking that way. That is a false positive. Now, just to be clear, a false positive isn't something such as somebody was behind you and you never saw them. That's not a false negative because obviously you can't see them outside your field of vision. But if somebody was right in front of you and you looked right at them and it never registered that you knew them, that would be an example of a false negative. And it's probably because your mind is elsewhere. And if you watch one of the other videos from this unit... I definitely go into great detail about selective attention and the fact that your brain can only think about one thing at a time. So, you know, you're walking down the hallway after having failed a quiz and, you know, you're stressed out and you're thinking about things like your grades and how you're going to fix this. And you might walk down the hallway and you may make dead eye contact with your friend and just keep on walking. And you were not purposely snubbing them. You were not purposely ignoring them. And they're like, what the heck? Like, what, like, what did I do? Well, they didn't do anything. You committed a false negative. And I bet they've done that to you before, too. You've had people, like, look you dead in the eye, and it just never registers that they're looking at their friend. False negative. False negatives often happen because you are not paying attention because you are paying attention to something else. Um, false negatives can certainly be very dangerous. And as I allude to in the other video, a false negative could be dangerous in the sense that if you are busy, you know, looking at or checking your phone, you could be looking out the the windshield, but still miss something extremely obvious, such as a stop sign or a car pulling out in front of you. So false negatives, you just you whiff, and, and it wasn't an the issue was not volume, the issue wasn't smell, the issue wasn't brightness. You just, your mind was elsewhere and it just whiffed um, that it was a false negative. So, uh, for example, using, um, you know, if you use medical terminology, a false positive would be that you went and got a test done and they said you actually did have COVID-19, but then they did subsequent tests and it turns out that was a false positive and you actually didn't have it at all. Uh, obviously, that does happen. Unfortunately, a false negative would be, um, you know, they tested you and they said, nope, you tested negative for COVID-19. And so you went about your day and your life and then things happen all of a sudden like, oh, sorry, that must have been a false negative because it turns out you do. So again, just apply psychology and that medical terminology. You're, it's the same thing. It's about detecting it, uh, like missing it um, because you thought you heard it. You thought you smelled it. You thought you saw it, whatever. But it turns out it wasn't there or it wasn't what you thought it was or a false negative. You missed it, even though it definitely was detectable. Uh, now, the word subliminal. Subliminal, uh, before we actually talk about subliminal messaging, and I highly encourage you to check out um, the video in the description below. Uh, there is a SciShow video that basically talks about subliminal messaging, and it kind of sets the record straight on the fact that subliminal messaging is not quite as uh, mysterious. It's not quite as, um, not quite as mystical as people make it out to be. So first of all, the definition of subliminal is a lot simpler. Subliminal is anything that is below your 50-50 detection rate. So anything below 50-50 at a certain volume, at a certain frequency, at a certain brightness, at a certain odor concentration, at a certain temperature, whatever, it's less than a 50-50 chance that you should be able to detect it. But notice I didn't say it was a 0% chance. So subliminal is just anything that is below a 50-50. So if, you know, if they play a light, or sorry, if they play a sound or they show you a light or a certain frequency or a certain temperature and they do, you know, 20 uh, they do 20 on you, uh, and, and, and you indicate, you know, five of the 20 times you did detect it, um, well, that would be subliminal, because you certainly detected it, but you detected it less than half the time at that level, so that would be considered below the 50-50 threshold, therefore it's subliminal. So subliminal, the word, it really isn't that mysterious, it really isn't all that, you know, uh, like I said, it's not really all that eerie. 
so as they make it out to be. So subliminal means you could absolutely detect this thing. It's just that you have less than a 50-50 chance. Okay, so you can think of subliminal almost like an underdog in, in, in a sporting contest. Just because, you know, that one team is heavily favored over the other, so that other team, you could think of their chances are basically subliminal. They don't have a great chance of winning. That doesn't mean upsets can't be pulled off. Well, the same thing applies with subliminal information. Just because it's unlikely, and most of the time we know that you would not likely be able to detect it, that doesn't mean you can't necessarily detect it. Now, the other interesting thing about subliminal is that just because you might not detect it consciously doesn't mean your brain might not be able to pick it up anyway. So here is a good example of that. It was called the intuition weight test. Uh, and I've seen multiple versions of this. So very quickly, uh, they basically asked people to pick up 50 pounds. And then they had them put down the 50 pounds. Then, without telling them which one it was, they either added a couple of ounces or they removed a couple of ounces from the 50 pounds. And then they asked them to pick it up again. Now, do you honestly think you can tell the difference between 50 pounds and 50 pounds plus or minus a couple of ounces? No, that is well below the detection rate for weight change. However, they asked people to pick it up the second time, and then they asked them, did it get lighter, did it get heavier? Now, most people reported saying, I don't know. Most people said it felt the same. But they made them take a guess. They said, well, that's fine, I understand, but tell, take a guess. Well, did it get heavier? Did it get lighter? Now, in theory, you'd think it'd be a 50-50 chance. However, research showed about uh, people were able to guess the right answer about 70% of the time. Can you imagine if you could guess a 50-50 coin flip right 70% of the time? Okay, there's a shiny city in the desert waiting on you. Uh, so that was intuition. So just because it was below their detection rate doesn't mean their brain didn't notice it. Now, that being said, what about subliminal messaging? First of all, uh, subliminal messaging, if you watch, again, I encourage you to watch the description in the video below uh, for setting the straight on subliminal messaging. A couple things I do want to point out. First of all, subliminal messaging really, really got the attention of psychologists after a, I believe it was a New Jersey movie theater in the late 1950s reported that they purposely put subliminal messages in their um in their movie clips. So at the beginning of the movies, like during um, the previews, apparently they reported that they flashed really quick, like way, way too quick for you to pick it up consciously. But they would flash things such as eat candy, buy Coke, uh, you know, eat popcorn. And then they also reported that not only had that, had they done that, but they also reported that their sales for concessions had gone up. And then that was published and, and people uh, you know, f you know, freaked out. Like, oh my goodness, like it's, like, it's basically brainwashing. Well, first of all, they never actually, it was later found out, they never actually did the, um, they never did any subliminal messaging in the video clips. And um, they had falsified their concession numbers to make it look like that had worked. So, first, so is, is, is subliminal messaging, is it legal? The answer is yes. Uh, the U.S. Supreme in, in the United States, in other countries, like for example in the U.K., they have ruled that subliminal messaging is illegal. However, in the United States, subliminal messaging is absolutely legal. Now, do advertisers use subliminal messaging? Not really. And here is why. And it's also part of the reason why subliminal messaging is perfectly legal. Um, most companies do not waste their time with subliminal messaging because study after study after study has shown that while subliminal advertising and subliminal messaging can be detected, it in no way, shape, or form is any more effective than traditional advertising, and there have been studies that have shown it's actually worse, and companies don't tend to spend money that they um, you know, are going to be on something that doesn't work. So that's probably one of the reasons why it is allowed to exist. So the problem they found is that subliminal messaging, just because it can be detected, it doesn't make you lose any more free will and doesn't make you do anything you wouldn't have done 
when exposed to pretty much any type of advertising at all. So, for example, if you're sitting on the couch watching commercials and then a commercial for a car company comes up or a cereal company comes up or McDonald's comes up, as much as advertisers would like it, you're not going to just mindlessly like leave your house that very moment and go buy McDonald's and go buy a new car, go buy that cereal. And if you're not in the market for wanting McDonald's, if you're not in the market for a new car, if you're not in the market to try a new cereal, it isn't going to work either. So how advertising works is the idea that one day you'll be driving down the road and you probably will be hungry or you will you know, be in the market for a new car or one day we will get, you know, you will be in the cereal aisle. And that is when they hope that maybe their advertising and their jingles and their funny commercials and their reminders and be like, oh, yeah, that's right. I remember about this car. Or, oh, yeah, that's right. I remember the McRib is back. Or, oh, yeah, I remember uh, about this cereal. Um, that's not subliminal. So subliminal advertising, why would they waste their time flashing images or flashing logos or flashing colors? Because it's not, you know, first of all, there's a good chance that most of the consumers wouldn't pick it up anyway. And again, there's no evidence that subliminal advertising is any more effective than just straight up old advertising. Um, so they don't want to waste their time. But again, I do point out that it is possible to have subliminal pressures that do lean you in certain ways, but they only lean you in ways that make you want to be in that direction anyway. They don't take away from you being whatever it is and doing whatever it is you were going to do anyway. They just kind of nudge you even closer in the direction you were all already going to go. So I highly encourage you to watch the subliminal advertising. Now, let's talk about priming. Priming is a word that I could talk about all year long, and there will be multiple times this year where I may not say the word prime, or priming, but I'm definitely implying priming. So priming is when uh, you are exposed to a certain stimuli so that later you will like think a certain way about more stimuli or the next stimuli. And there's a lot of ways priming can go, but basically key words, key colors, key sounds, key phrasing, key smells. They're purposely priming your brain so that when later you look at things or are asked to think about things or watch things or do things, it gets you to react in a specific way as opposed to an alternative way that would have been just as likely had I not primed you. So priming you is about basically getting your brain to interpret information the way we want in, that, that otherwise would have been subjectively up for debate. So there's many examples of priming. So, for example, in priming, if they, you know, think about some news, news organizations, it doesn't matter that Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act are two names for the exact same thing. At the same time, while I certainly would not encourage you to use these interchangeably, illegal immigrant and undocumented citizen, technically you could argue are two sides of the same coin. However, they purposely are priming you with certain terminology because, you know, for example, usually Obamacare is usually used to set you up for a negative priming, whereas Affordable he uh, Health Care Act is purposely designed to make you positively primed. And so priming is often done to get you to think a certain way or look at things a certain way. So um, restaurants prime you with their logo. Um, you'll notice that almost every fast food restaurant uses yellow and red as their two primary colors. That's not a coincidence. Both yellow and red have been used to be purposeful, emotional, and motivational priming colors to get you to want to pull over and eat. So 
there's a reason why companies will use certain colors, such as, for example, often green is used as a primer for either growth or financial success because of its association with nature and money, and therefore it's a priming pull. Um, uh, most grocery stores, there's a reason why they put the produce at the beginning. Um, you know, they put the, they put the, the produce at the very beginning. And a lot of that is because that, you know, other areas are going to have older stuff or frozen stuff or canned goods. No, right out of the gate, they want you to see fresh foods. They want you to see fresh vegetables and fresh, um, uh, fruits because it primes you right off the bat. And so the priming can be done that way. Now, in the description below, I encourage you to watch a couple of excellent, again, I am a, I'm a big fan, uh, one of my side things, I love magic, uh, I love um, sleight of hand, I love misdirection, I love uh, things like that, and so I encourage you to watch a couple of videos that I have shown, uh, given you below in the description below, they are two different uh, video clips um, from a show on Netflix called Magic for Humans, and in both cases you'll notice that he primes them. He primes them with key words, key phrases, key ideas. They don't know they're being primed. But then when he gives them an open-ended answer, such as, okay, name any celebrity, he gets them to almost all name the same exact celebrity because he primed them that way. Okay, He gets them to all choose the same photo because he primed them that way. So you, get, you prime the pump to make it work. And so... Uh, your parents can either purposely or inadvertently sometimes prime you because, you know, for example, using your full name as opposed to just saying your name, but using your full name, whether it's purposeful or accidental, probably purposeful, they're priming you to start, you know, to think in a certain way about panic and fear. You know, just like somebody, you know, one of the worst things they could do for you uh, could be like, sit down, we need to talk. Well, I seriously doubt that what's going to happen after that is like, yes, you know, who's getting ice cream? Probably not, because they're priming you with some really bad sounding terminology. And so priming um, is just, a, a, a just, it's a way that it's done purposely or accidentally with key words, key smells, key visions, key sights. There's a reason why they're priming you. Casinos do a good job of this. Um, most casinos, for example, they put, the highest paying slots closest to the major walkways because they want pedestrians that are walking by to hear that ching, 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 ching over and over again because it primes them to think that this is a casino associated with winning when in reality almost all the casinos are about the same, but they're competing for your business. And so they're really trying to get you with that priming techniques. Now, let me show you an example, and this, I mean, or not show you an example, but talk about an example. And this one's, it, it's, it, it's not as bad as it sounds. Kittens versus dead bodies. Again, it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. So anyway, they took a bunch of people and they put them into two different theaters. And they had them watch a series of everyday, normal-looking people's faces, like headshots of everyday, normal average looking people and they just showed them a picture after a picture after a picture of just normal everyday looking people's headshots and it was the same photos in both theaters okay both theaters so both theaters same exact order they would see an everyday ordinary looking face followed by a quick transition followed by another face quick transition another face quick transition another face at the end of the slideshow Everybody in both theaters was asked to complete a survey ranking the faces on a scale of like 1 to 10 on how attractive they thought they were. Now, you would think that if you looked at the average of the one theater and the average of the other theater, the numbers should be pretty close together. However, what they found was that the one theater, the, the, the patrons of the one theater, consistently rated all of the faces to be significantly more attractive than average, in the other theater, same exact faces, uh, rated them as significantly lower than average um, across the board. Well, why? Well, it was because of the quick transition. Now, when the people were watching the slideshow, there was a face followed by a quick white flash screen followed by another face and over and over again. Face, white flash screen, face, white flash screen. 
Now, at the end, after everyone had done the surveys, when they did um, when they did the debriefing, they asked them, did you notice anything else about the slideshow other than the faces? And most of the people did report that they noticed that there was a white flash in between the photos. But most of the people also reported that they noticed the white flash. But that was it. They didn't notice anything else about it. Well, unbeknownst to them, the white flashes in the one movie theater kept showing very super quick images, way too quick for you to consciously detect. They were flashing them pictures of really cute things, like puppies and kittens and flowers and chocolates and people holding hands and people kissing and stuff like that. And that caused them to be primed to think of the other of the people's faces as being more attractive than they actually were because they kept priming them with cutesy stuff. The other people, same photos, but this time the white flashes were producing things such as trash, pollution, like war-torn cities, um, burning you know, buildings, uh, decomposing corpses, I believe, stuff like that. And as a result, they kept priming them over and over and over again in a negative fashion, unbeknownst to them. So that's priming. I could go on and on and on with priming. I could certainly prime you on like one of the 50-50s. For example, if I said, hey, check out this white bold dress that went viral, I just primed you. Because the white dress, the white gold dress, and slash, aka the blue black dress, uh, nationally, it was about a 50 50 split of who saw it which way. But I primed you. You know, I could be priming you if I said, hey, check out, you know, this white gold dress. Now, you could see it blue black, but I primed you to think of it one way more than the other. Uh, and as a result, you're more likely to interpret it the way that I primed you to do. Uh, so priming, whether it's purposeful or accidental, it often gets you to prime their logic and reasoning and perception into a certain way. Now, as I pointed out, subliminal messaging exists, um, but it's not necessarily any more potent or powerful than traditional advertising. And I think this uh, study right here is a really good job of showing it. So bear with me. So in this experiment, and I believe this was <laughs> this was like back in the 80s. So we're going to be talking about cassette Walkmans here. So everybody before the experiment was asked to rate their self-esteem. And they were also given a memory test to see how good their memory recall skills were. Then everyone was given a cassette tape. And everyone was given the same, like, top hits. Like, it was, like, top music hits of the time. And they were asked to listen to that music for a couple of weeks. Like, multiple times, listen to the cassettes. And they also told them straight out. Half of them, they were told, yes, there are some hits on here that I want you to listen to. But there is also um, subliminal messaging dubbed into the taping about tips and hints on how to improve your self-esteem. For the other half of the people, they were given the same catchy music, uh, the top hits at that time, and they were told that there was subliminal messaging uh, masked into the tape uh, on tips and hints on how to improve their memory skills. So then they went home and they listened to those tapes for several weeks. Then they all came back. Everyone was asked to do the same thing over again. Rate their self-esteem, and then they were asked to take a memory test. Well, not shockingly... The people who had gotten the tips and hints on their self-esteem, subliminal messaging, they reported having higher levels of self-esteem, but their memory results did not improve. They stayed about the same. However, the people that got the tips and hints on the memory for subliminal messaging on their tapes, they rated their self-esteem as being about the same, but lo and behold, their memories did improve. Now, if you're like, ah, well, I bet there was no subliminal messaging at all. Well, actually, there was. That's the beauty of this experiment. They gave everybody the opposite of what they told them. So the people thought they were listening to self-esteem tips. They were actually listening to how to improve their memory. But their memory didn't go up. Their self-esteem did because of the self-fulfilling prophecy. For the other people, their, you know, they, their, their memories went up because that's what they thought they were listening to. But they were, had actually given them tips and hints on how to improve their self-esteem. And yet it did not budge because, again, subliminal messaging is not as powerful, it seems, as the uh, placebo effect or the self-fulfilling prophecy. All right. Uh, let's talk about this one right here. 
Uh, the easiest way for you to understand this one would be if you watch a video in the description below. Again, I would love to show this video among and just like all these videos I keep alluding to, I would love to watch them, but they would or show them in this video, but they would just block them or um, take my video down. But you definitely are going to want to watch this one uh, because this is a clip from The Office. So if you uh, go into the description below this video, you should see a link to um, Dwight's complaints about Jim, and then it runs through several, several complaints um, that Dwight has about Jim and his complaint file. Now, the two I would want you to pay attention to, enjoy the whole video clip, please. Uh, they're all hilarious. But the two that I want you to pay attention to is when Dwight complains about Jim putting more and more and more, or sorry, sorry, Dwight complains because he hit himself in his head with his own phone, at which point Jim later explains that he just kept putting nickels into the headset over time and, and letting Dwight get used to the uh, weight until he took all the nickels out and then Dwight hit himself in the face. And the other one is when, um, by the end of the day, Dwight was like two feet closer to the bathroom and Jim admitted later in the interview that every time uh, Dwight left his desk, he basically moved it an inch at a time. So, the reason why I'm asking you to know those is because they are two good examples of what is called difference threshold, or J and D, just noticeable difference. Now, these up here, absolute threshold, signal detection theory, response criteria, this is about detecting a stimulus at a certain place, like a certain temperature, a certain brightness, a certain frequency, a certain decibel level. However, this one is about how much will the original have to change before you would notice that it has changed. Remember, I said it previously with subliminal that they were making people pick up 50 pound weights and then they added or subtracted a couple ounces and people were like, I don't know if it got heavier or lighter. Well, that is because that is below the J and D. Okay. So difference threshold or just noticeable difference is the bare minimum amount of change that will have to take place to the new intensity you know, the new volume, the new brightness, the new odor, uh, the new frequency, the new temperature, whatever, that the person would notice at half the time. So if it's, you know, 80 degrees, and all of a sudden it ticks up to 80.1 degrees, I don't think you're going to probably notice. If it's at, you know, 120 decibels, well, hopefully not that loud. So if it's at 80 decibels, and all of a sudden it drops to 79 point eight decibels, you probably would not notice the difference. Now, at the same time, if the volume was at 40 decibels and someone cranked it up to 60, you would definitely notice it, but that would not be the just noticeable because that's way more than is necessary. All right. You would definitely be able to notice if a, um, you know, a smell went from, you know, a light odor to a very pungent smell, of course you would notice the difference, but that's not the just noticeable difference. So just noticeable difference is when you can just barely detect the, the change half the time. So um, how can you like undercut that? Well, that's exactly what Jim was doing. He was moving the desk too little for it to be detected. He was putting nickels in there that were too low to be detected. If he had put too much weight in the phone at the time, or if he had put uh, moved the desk too much, Dwight would have been alerted. But because he kept undercutting the J and D, Dwight was never able to know. So if you are, for example, having a battle with your roommate over the temperature of the house, then when they're not looking, don't crank it up five, six degrees, or whatever the major argument is between you, move it one degree over and over again over a long span of time and let them get used to it and then move it again. Same thing with volume. If you guys are having disagreements on volume or disagreements about spacing or whatever, fine. A little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, they might not notice. Or by the time they notice, it might have been that way for a while. So that's the J and B is the bare minimum of when you can notice the change. Anything less than that would be subliminal. Anything more than that would be overkill. That brings me to probably the most difficult thing on here, and that is what is called Weber's Law. 
Uh, and if you find this to be difficult, you are welcome to be mad at Ernst Weber. He has been dead for a long time, so I don't think he cares about your complaints. Uh, so let me just give you an example so you can understand Weber's law maybe better. Let's say you had a jar, or let's say somebody you knew had a jar of like 10,000 pennies. And you're going to be kind of a jerk, and you're going to steal some of their pennies. How many pennies do you think you could get away with? A couple hundred, maybe, before they would notice, maybe even more. Now, let's say they had a jar, like they had a dish with 100 pennies in it. How many pennies do you think you could steal and get away with it? Certainly not a couple hundred, maybe 10. So let's say that, um, you know, if you put that in perspective, when it's a really large number, there might require a large amount of change. When it's a really small number, it wouldn't require that much for them to notice the change. That's the key to Weber's law. It's about a change of proportion. Not a change of a number, a change of proportion. So let's say you detected, like let's say you did research on J and D or difference threshold. So you decided to work with a 60 watt light bulb. And then you decided to either increase or decrease the wattage until your participant said, I noticed it got brighter or I noticed it got dimmer. And let's say after many, many trials, it turns out that you need to change it from 60 to 63 or 60 to 57. Uh, and that gives you the J and D for 60 watts it is apparently three watts of change up to 63 down to 57 equals you understand now uh, the J and D. So, you don't have to do a 40-watt light bulb now. You don't have to do an 80-watt light bulb. You don't have to do a 100-watt light bulb or a 120-watt light bulb. Ernst Weber has already proven this for you. So, instead of making them do an 80-watt light bulb, you already know the answer because of your research at 60. Now, is the answer 83 and 77? No. It's, remember, think back to the pennies. When it was 10,000 pennies, you could steal a couple hundred. Now it's down to 100 pennies. You can only steal a few. So it's about proportion of change. So if you find that at, you know, at, at 60, it changes by 3 watts, that's a 5% change. So now you can just take for watts, watts only. You can't, you can't switch this over now to pounds or frequency or whatever. You have to stick with watts. But now you don't have to do the math for any of the rest of them except to figure out the percentage. So at 80 watts, it's 84 or 76. That's when they would have said something. At 100, it's 105 or 95. At 120, it's 126 or it's 114. You already found the answer the first time. Now, if you switch over to frequency... Once you figure out the percentage of change in a certain frequency, you got the answer at every frequency. Now, I give you some examples here. At light, it's actually an 8% change. At weight, it's a 2% change. And at tone, a 3.3% change. Apparently, we're really good at detecting frequencies change. Uh, you don't need to know the actual numbers. But have an idea of how Weber's Law works. Once you figure out the percentage of change on that topic, smell, brightness, frequency, volume, whatever. Now you know what it is everywhere on the spectrum of that thing. That is called Weber's Law. The last thing for this one is probably the simplest word on here of all of these, and that is called sensory adaptation. Let me give you two very simple examples of sensory adaptation. You have been sleeping in your pitch black room all night, and then the next morning, your parents are cruel, and they flip your overhead light on, and it burns, and it burns, and it burns. And then after a few minutes, your eyes are fine. But the light hasn't changed. It's still just as bright as it was at the beginning. Or you jump into the pool, and the pool is cold. And then after a few minutes, the pool is not cold. And yet, the temperature of the pool has not changed. Or you walk into a bakery, and it smells, oh, so, so good. But you've been in the bakery now for an hour. You know, because you're like, maybe you sit down and, and eat there because they have tables. Now you've been sitting in there for an hour. You don't smell hardly any of the stuff anymore that you did when it first hit you when you walked in. This is called sensory adaptation. Sensory adaptation basically says 
that after the initial response to a stimulus, if that stimulus stays the same, like the brightness in your bedroom, the temperature in the pool, the odor level in the bakery, after a while, your senses become less interested in it. They adapt to it. And as a result, your brain stops caring about it. One of the things we definitely know about your brain, it definitely prioritizes things that change. Things that stay the same, it starts to ignore them. That's you know one of the main reasons why pain you know pain, pain tolerance. Okay, you know you, you're listening to something at a certain volume, and it might be not uncomfortably loud, but definitely loud. But after a while, you get used to it. Well, sensory adaptation. Now, how does it change? You would have to get out of the pool and then start you know over again, or you'd have to leave the bakery for a while and then come back in. You'd have to turn the lights back off for a while and let yourself get used to it. Then your eyes or ears or nose or whatever will adapt again. Then the next time you encounter it, bam, you have to start all over again. So sensory adaptation, your senses become less interested and less responsive to things that don't change, and your brain stops ignoring, like, basically your brain ignores it and stops paying any attention to it. So sensory adaptation, hopefully you have uh, an easy understanding for that one. I could go on and on with that one, but I don't know why. So anyway, so that's it for this video. I know that was a lot. It's certainly one of the more complicated videos of Unit Three. Uh, there are certainly a lot of uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of heavyweight information here. There's also a lot of confusing pairs and and a lot of things here that are very related. If you have any questions or concerns, as always, please ask me. I encourage you again, please check out the videos in the description below that I highlighted. One, because they are informative. But two, in most cases, I try to choose ones that are hilarious. Um, but that's it for this video. So I will see you next time.